Consuming large amounts of certain kinds of fish can expose individuals to toxic levels of mercury, resulting in neurological symptoms that can be severe. I was really an avid athlete. I ran a lot, I played tennis, um, I worked out, and um, I was running um, out, out in the country at my home, and all of a sudden I had balance problems. I would shake, I mean if I hold my fingers out you can see now that there's a little bit of shaking to it. But when I would go to sleep at night, my left arm would shake like I had Parkinson's disease. My running problems turned into even more walking problems. So I'd feel a loss of balance and a fear in trying to cross the street. But overexposure to mercury as a result of seafood consumption often goes unrecognized by medical professionals. At that point, you're, you just say to yourself, what, what is happening to me and why can't anybody find out what's going on? All fish and shellfish contain some mercury, but larger, longer living predatory fish like shark, tuna and swordfish contain the highest levels. There are several forms of mercury that we are exposed to, but the most toxic form is methylmercury. Uh, that we are commonly exposed to. And methylmercury is a form that we encounter when we eat seafood. Methylmercury in seafood or freshwater fish is particularly hazardous because it can cross the blood-brain barrier. And eating too much high mercury fish can have associated health effects, effects that all too often go unrecognized, undiagnosed, and thus not properly treated. Methylmercury is not you know, on everybody's lips and it comes to teaching about uh, medical problems. And because some of the, the main symptoms that we attribute to methylmercury are symptoms that can occur from many other diseases that people tend to be more familiar with, uh, doctors don't tend to think about mercury first or even at all. I'm Richard Gelfon. I'm CEO of IMAX Corporation, the entertainment technology company. Um, I became very interested in mercury in about 2006-2007. I had a lot of symptoms that it took almost a year to diagnose, including um, loss of balance, some tremors in my hands. Um, I went through kind of a medical odyssey where people couldn't figure it out. Over the course of a year, as Richard Gelfond sought treatment by top-ranked Manhattan doctors, not one of them asked him about his diet. So I went to a neurologist and um, they tried understanding what was wrong with me. And in the first meeting, the neurologist said to me, I think you have a brain tumor, go get an MRI immediately. Um, so I went to get an MRI, needless to say, I was very frightened. Finally, he went into one physician's office who just happened to have read an article, I believe, in the New York Times the day before, and still had the paper in his office. And this article in the Times said, boy, there's a lot of mercury in some types of seafood. And so he asked uh, Mr. Gelfond, well, is there anything funny about your diet? Or? And he said, no, no, it's a very healthy diet. He eats nothing but seafood. And the guy said, no, just for the hell of it, let's, let's have your blood tested. So a $20 test instead of a $15,000 test. Determining an individual's exposure to methylmercury is done via a blood metals test or by taking a hair sample. The Environmental Protection Agency has defined a criteria for excessive exposure for women of childbearing age as blood mercury levels above 5.8 micrograms per liter, which corresponds to about one microgram per gram in hair. Many laboratories only report values over 10 micrograms per liter so blood mercury levels over 5.8 micrograms per liter might be missed unless a lower range is specified by the ordering physician. I think a lot of the conventional literature talks about uh, pregnant women and developing fetuses, and I, I think people just hadn't focused that much on um, the role of mercury in healthy adults. People who were exposed to other forms of mercury, like elemental mercury, the liquid quicksilver, uh, that's usually excreted in the urine. 
Uh, but methylmercury is not so much in the urine and we don't see elevated uh, urinary mercury typically. Dr. Michael Gottschfeld is one of the few doctors on the East Coast who regularly treats patients with mercury exposure from seafood. He notes that individuals vary widely in sensitivity to methylmercury toxicity. So we'll analyze their hair and we'll typically see a hair level above 6 or even above 10. And we see people who are symptomatic at levels around 10 or even a little below 10. And we see people who are asymptomatic with levels above 10. So it's pretty obvious that there's individual variation in, in susceptibility to the mercury. And the same thing with blood. We'll see people who are asymptomatic and their blood mercury is over 100. And some doctors say that you don't have to worry until the mercury gets above 200. And yet we've seen people who are pretty clearly symptomatic with mercury levels in the 20, 30, 40 range. Geometric mean blood mercury levels in the U.S. are about one microgram per liter for adults. Women of childbearing age are urged to keep blood levels well below the reference level of 5.8 micrograms per liter in blood, or one part per million in hair and it is currently recommended that a blood mercury level above 5 micrograms per liter calls for counseling of patients with regard to fish consumption, emphasizing low mercury species. Rich Gelfond's blood mercury level was 13 times the EPA's reference level of 5.8 micrograms per liter. Um, before I had even gotten the official results, I got a call from New York State's Department of Environmental Health, and they told me that it was um, 78, um, I, I think it's micrograms per liter or something like that. And um, they said 10 was considered high. And they asked me if I worked at an industrial waste site or an alkaline battery factory, because I guess their mission is to protect industrial workers. He had assumed that eating fish was the key to healthy living. Leading up to when I was diagnosed with it, you know, it, it was clear I was eating it around two times a day. So sometimes, you know, for breakfast, I'd have smoked salmon. You know, many days for lunch, I'd have a tuna burger or sushi. Um, my wife, um, you know, thought she was doing the right thing and making um, swordfish for dinner. So I, I was eating a lot of fish and probably over a fairly long period of time. It was a sense of astonishment when I found out that, you know, what I thought I was doing was good for me was, in fact, um, poisoning me. My name is Deborah Landvik Larson Fellner, and in 2006, I came to find out that I have mercury poisoning. Mike was watching a television show one night, and he says, you can't believe this, this is you. One of the partners in this company is poisoning the other. He brought him coffee every day and was putting mercury in it. And he's in a wheelchair and he's drooling, and he has the same symptoms you do. Deborah had her blood tested, and it turned out her mercury levels were 48 micrograms per liter about eight times the reference level. Over there is my soy milk. Deborah has Crohn's disease, an inflammatory bowel disorder, and had found that eating tuna helped those symptoms. I believe the, uh, the fatties, the f omega fatties that are in the tuna fish um, really did help put my condition into remission. And I did feel tremendously better. The more I ate, the better I felt. And then when I did start experiencing some other symptoms, I kept thinking, oh goodness, my Crohn's is acting up again. I better eat another can of tuna fish. Those other symptoms were from acute mercury poisoning. Deborah had been eating a can of tuna fish every day for over a decade before she realized she was giving herself another condition. Periodically during that time frame, I would fall down and everyone kept saying you're rushing around you got to slow down you're not paying attention to what you're doing and actually it was come to find out later because of the mercury poison i think people get a mixed message because the medical community also tells them and rightly so that uh, seafood can be very good for them and for their developing fetus so one of the lessons i think is that we need to advise the public which forms of seafood are relatively innocuous with regard to mercury toxicity and which ones are riskier. Eating moderate amounts of low mercury fish is good for you. 
The omega-3 fatty acids fish contain may reduce the risk of death from heart attack and stroke in adults and may be important for early brain development. There's evidence from many articles that eating fish is good for you. Um, and whether that benefit comes from some nutrients in the fish like the omega-3 fatty acids as advocates would uh, believe or whether it's from the fact that every time you eat a fish meal you're not eating a red meat a fatty red meat meal or simply from the fact that people who tend to eat a lot of fish also engage in other healthy lifestyles uh, we don't know probably all three of those play a role it's important however to know which fish can be eaten regularly and which should be limited to occasional meals. It's mostly your large predatory fish where you have to worry about, uh, about methylmercury. The highest levels are typically found in various types of tuna, particularly bluefin tuna. Swordfish are very high, shark are very high. We have seen individuals who eat swordfish once a month. Their mercury levels are on average about two micrograms per liter higher than individuals who eat, who eat swordfish less than that. Um, if you eat swordfish once a week, your mercury levels on average are about nine or ten micrograms per liter higher than individuals who don't eat swordfish. It's estimated that around one-third of the methylmercury that fish consumers are exposed to comes from tuna. Tuna uh, tends to have 0.5 parts per million or more. Canned white tuna has 0.4 parts per million. Halibut, for example, uh, can have uh, pretty high levels. Some of the sea basses can have high levels. And salmon, depending on where it comes from, is about 0.1. Uh, Salmon's a really good trade-off because most salmon tends to be pretty high in omega-3 fatty acids. And so, uh, although it may not make the salmon very happy, uh, it certainly is the best trade-off in terms of the dietary components. We use a cutoff of 0 0.1 parts per million. Fish lower than that are usually okay. Uh, but even then, if you eat two meals of fish every day, you've got to pay attention to the size of the fish meals. And uh, because even at low mercury levels, people can still build up their, their body mercury. Pregnant and breastfeeding women and young children should eat fish, but will reap the benefits and minimize the risks by eating eight to 12 ounces of low mercury fish and shellfish per week. For example, two weekly meals of salmon, trout, oysters, or herring. I believe that people who never eat fish probably will get health benefits from adding fish to their diet. But people who eat fish frequently really have to pay attention to the mercury content. And by frequently, I'm talking about uh, two or more than two meals a week. Uh, these are the people whom we see in our clinic. Many of them eat fish almost every day. Mr. Gelfond was a prime example of that. So was um, Deborah. Deborah and Rich, who both had unusually high mercury exposure, exhibited such symptoms as clumsy gait, difficulty walking, slurred speech, and sometimes a kind of tunnel vision. Physicians encountering any of the following symptoms in patients should consider mercury exposure and ask about the patient's diet. We do see the tingling in the lips and fingers, but very often their main uh, thing uh, would be sleep disturbances, for example, or hair thinning. Um, some people complain of a ground glass sensation on their feet, which is part of the peripheral nerve damage that the mercury is causing. I would feel like I'm stepping on glass or I stepped on a bee. Now I've got shoes and socks on. I pull my socks off, I say maybe I stepped on something, there would be nothing there. Multiple studies show that individuals vary widely in sensitivity to mercury toxicity. Not everyone with high exposure experiences adverse effects and relatively low blood mercury levels can produce symptoms. We're thinking that there are a variety of genetic factors that may influence how the mercury gets distributed in the body. 
what it's uh, linked to, which may make it more or less likely to get into the brain or into the central nervous system. Uh, there have been a number of genes that people have talked about uh, and are investigating. The other thing that we've learned from our fish eaters is if they stop eating fish and their mercury levels decline, most of the symptoms regress. Typically, we begin to see improvement by six months and substantial improvement by a year. And this comes from people telling us that that's what they've experienced. Once blood mercury has declined to less than five micrograms per liter and symptoms have resolved, low methylmercury fish and shellfish can be reintroduced to the diet. The half-life of methylmercury in blood is about 50 to 70 days in adults, but can vary significantly. The half-life is longer in neonates, and research suggests that genetic variation may account for additional differences. And obviously, the minute I heard I had the mercury poisoning, I did stop eating the tuna fish. And as a long period of time went on, some of the symptoms that I had would dissipate, but then there were others that didn't. What's this big cream of rice section over here? Deborah's decade of mercury exposure left lasting neurological damage. Finlandia cheese, which is uh, lactose free. I think m not only the amount of tuna that I ate that contained the mercury, because I ate white albacore in water, which contains the highest amount of mercury versus a chunk light. After I stopped eating fish, the symptoms started to recede, and I was able to balance better, and then a little later than that, uh, the neuropathy started to um, uh, feel a lot better. Dr. Gotchfield believes there are times and places for chelation therapy but not usually with regards to long-term fish consumption, where the methylmercury builds up over a long period of time and there is gradual development of symptoms. Rich Gelfon's doctor considered chelation, but decided against it. He considered chelation therapy, um, but then his view was that had side effects, such as um, bad effects on the kidneys. Um, we tried to find the right toxicity um, specialist. We couldn't really find people who knew about mercury. So then eventually he said, well, it seems to me one thing is clear is stop eating fish. So please join me uh, in welcoming uh, IMAX's CEO and a great friend of Stony Brook University, Rich Gelfond. Gelfond was so shaken by his own experience, he set up a fund at Stony Brook University to promote more research and public awareness about mercury in seafood. It is an underreported problem among the Asian Americans in the New York metropolitan area. Almost half of them have what are considered to be elevated blood mercury levels. So this is, you know, enough to get your attention that it, it may be a problem that is more widespread than has been recognized thus far. Fish consumption is on the rise and has been for several years, uh, perhaps because, you know, now we're applying what we've learned over the past 10 or 20 years that, you know, red meat, you know, you don't want to eat as much of as perhaps some of us grew up eating around the table and that we want to diversify our protein source a bit more. And, and that's, I think that's been good. In general, we want to encourage diverse foods and we want to encourage different types of, of seafood. We just don't want someone eating tuna or swordfish every day. Our interest focuses on the high-end fish consumer, the frequent fish consumer, what most uh, epidemiologists call outliers, and they dismiss them because they're outliers, and that's just a small percent of the population. But if you're one of those outliers, you're 100 percent of, of the population. And so uh, people who eat fish twice a week or more, including many people who eat fish every day, and who proudly say, I ate a can of tuna fish every day for years because I thought it was good for me, or I fed it to my kids because I thought it was good for them. Uh, those are the people that we have the most concern with. Those are the people that we think are the ones most at risk. Epidemiologist Jamie Melliker is heading up a study of seafood consumers on Long Island. We've run a 300-person cohort study looking at the relationship between mercury and a variety of, of health outcomes in avid fish consumers. The Stony Brook researchers advertised in the newspaper, 
looking for self-described avid seafood eaters. 25% of all study participants had blood mercury levels above the standard reference range high value of 10 micrograms per liter. And the main challenge is that we don't know a lot at relatively low levels of exposure. Most of the epidemiologic literature we see associations at very high levels of mercury like in Minamata Bay where there was this mercury disaster um, and we saw birth defects. You know, but at these levels of exposure that aren't acutely toxic, where you don't see people, you know, keeling over, um, the, the question is, you know, uh, what are the health effects? Well, I think there definitely are segments of the population that are aware that, that there's mercury in, in fish. The problem is most of our health and risk communication, whenever it goes out, it causes people to stop eating fish altogether. And that's not what we want either, right? We just want people to eat a variety of different types of fish, preferably lower on the you know, food chain. Rich Gelfond and Deborah Fellner, still coping today, want to promote public awareness. I went to a physician that said to me, you know, after you came here, I decided to get myself checked because I eat a lot of sushi and come to find out that his mercury level was 13, which is above 10, which is, you know, what it shouldn't be. So you run into people all the time. I am an advocate for more information being out there to the public and mostly to physicians to please don't just stop where you're at. Look a little bit further. One reason I'm committed to sponsoring so much research is the doctors don't know. So is there a genetic predisposition? They don't know. So um, there really isn't a place you can go to get information. And you know, at Stony Brook, we're trying to start to change that.